Well, good morning again. Happy Sabbath. You know, as you've noticed, our service is maybe a little truncated with our praise sets, um, with no Lamb's Corner, because we have a very special guest this morning. Last night, we were able to introduce to you our special guest, which is Sandra Seifert. And Sandra Seifert, um, she's going to share more of her testimony, but she came all the way from the Philippi Philippines, correct? Philippines um, to really share her testimony. She has a great testimony. And what we are going to do today is allow it to her testimony to share the goodness of God. So I'm going to introduce Sandra. Uh, can you come on up here? This is Sandra Seifert. Go ahead and grab a mic. Good morning, I'm Pastor Rodney. And of course, to everyone, happy Sabbath. Thank you so much for the warm welcome as early as uh, yesterday. Um, I have fond memories of Chicago, actually. My son, Coco, was born here. And uh, yeah, it's really good to be back. Um, I feel like I have family, you know, at heart here from the faith. Um, so yeah. And I also wanted to know, are there any first timers at the church today? Anyone here for the first time? Oh, our photographer. <laughs> he has a really powerful camera, I see. Welcome. Uh, anyone else who's um, perhaps not Seventh-day Adventist, but here today? Oh, it looks like we have a lot of brothers and sisters with us today. So, Sandra, you know, this is not our first time meeting. Actually, when we, I heard that you'd be coming, I was... I was happy because, you know, back then when I was in California, we met in Central Filipino Church. So you have gone through different churches sharing your testimony. What's your story and what compels you to go to, um, to different churches um, sharing um, your life? Yeah, so I was actually um, traveling all the way from the Philippines to the U.S. Um, this is my third time to visit the States. Um, God has brought me here. I always wonder... Um, Pastor Ronnie, why, why me? You know, there's so many great preachers in the U.S. of A. But um, yeah, God has worked beautifully in my life. And uh, I decided, um, you know, through much prayer to take on the, the calling to serve him again and share this story. Um, I'll try to be as um, concise as I can be because the full testimony at churches that I give, which comes with visuals, is usually around 35 to 40 minutes. But um, for the sake of our um, program today, um, I'll condense it. But essentially, a lot of people ask me if I actually was born Adventist. And the, the answer to that is no. I was born to Catholic parents in a Seventh-day Adventist hospital in Taipei, Taiwan. So that's kind of the backstory. And then growing up, um, in retrospect, I believe that God used Seventh-day Adventist families as we were, yeah, you know, growing um, in the Philippines mainly uh, to plant seeds in our hearts um, and also in that of my mom because we had really good experiences with Seventh-day Adventists. They were always very welcoming, um, very health-oriented. I just noticed this pattern and very kind, very hospitable. But it wasn't until the age of 16, for me at least, that I had my very first, I call it gripping Bible study. And this was actually in the Philippines. I was modeling at the time and there was this uh, designer that I had worked for, modeled for, and uh, he invited me and my mother to attend a Bible study that he was hosting in his boutique. So in a way, God worked through fashion to, um, you know, knock on my heart that time. And um, we were very open. We said, sure, we'll attend a Bible study. And lo and behold, it changed my life completely. Because during that series, I learned so many important things that blew me away. And I want to narrow it down to three pillars of truth, I call them, that really, you know, sold me on the fact that the truth is within Seventh-day Adventism, the quality of truth that I searched for and that I was able to verify thus far. So the first pillar of truth, I call it, is the truth about um, health. Like Seventh-day Adventists, they have what is called a health message, um, and that is based on the fact that the Bible presents us with health principles. 
God says um, that he desires for us to prosper in health. That was his original design for us. He never wanted us to suffer from any form of diseases. And also in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 verses, or chapter 6 verses 19 to 22, um, it says there that our bodies are a temple bought with a price, right? So this is a gift, this body that we, um, that we own, and we need to take care of gifts. We don't just want to abuse it and do whatever. And... Um, I also realized in that study that God really has a special guideline or diet for his people. Even in the Garden of Eden, you'll see, like, you know, God really wanted us to essentially go plant-based, right? He knew that that would suffice for us um, to nourish ourselves. But then, of course, you, you have what is called history, um, the flood, and then, and then later on you see again in the journey of um, Moses how he... Um, led, uh, you know, the, his people out of Egypt, you see that um, God again provided a very specific diet for his people in the wilderness, which was manna, right? So you just, over time and with careful study and prayer, realize that God always desired for us to prosper in health. And so for me, that was something I had never known before, and I was pretty much just eating whatever I thought was delicious um, until the age of 16. So that's the first thing that really convinced me that this is, this is important and this is true. The next um, pillar of truth was the truth about the Sabbath. Because, um, you know, growing up in the Philippines, it's a very um, Catholic-dominant um, country. Uh, so I was just used to people going to church on Sunday. And, you know, even if I had known those Seventh-day Adventist families that planted seeds in our hearts, they never, like, pushed the Sabbath upon us which I thought was really nice. They were really just being themselves. But I then realized, oh, Sunday is not the true day of worship um, because we were studying this in, in the Bible study, right? So I asked, which day did Jesus keep? And then um, we found out um, based on the scripture that Jesus kept the Sabbath. So which day is the Sabbath, right? And then with more study and research, we find out that the original seven-day Sabbath is actually Saturday, right? Um, but why does everyone keep Sunday or like the whole world seems to be Sunday oriented in, when it comes to rest? So I did my own study and I discovered that back in 8538, I believe there was this emperor named Constantine and he actually moved the Sabbath from Saturday to Sunday to advance his own political agenda. And that basically was adapted as a tradition and carried on until our present day. So um, in a way, I felt deceived and really, you know, heavy at heart. And I wanted to share this information with more people, especially at the age of 16. I was like, wait a minute, if I know this, why don't other people know this? They need to know this. But I was just a student back then in high school. So... I prayed and I said, Lord, can you give me an opportunity to share this information? Because this is really important. People need to know the true day of, of worship is uh, a Sabbath. You know, that's what Jesus kept when he was here on earth. And God presented me with an opportunity. So I was in my final year of high school and we had to submit a thesis worth 3,500 words. And it could be on any subject matter, any topic. So... I, I realized that was my chance. So you know what I, I wrote my thesis on? This is my topic. Sabbath versus Sunday. Which is the true day of worship? So from the title alone, you can already tell. Wait, Sabbath is not Sunday, right? So that was my, my topic. And um, of course, I did all my research, all my due diligence, I submitted all my empirical evidence, um, which was required to prove that Sabbath is a true day of worship. And um, here's, the, here's the catch. The person or professor who graded my, um, my thesis was actually a Catholic reverend. So it was going to be an interesting situation. But I did my part. And you know, when, when you advocate for the truth and you stand firm um, and you can defend it, God will also back you up. So... Um, did I pass or did I fail? Of course I passed. God is good. And I also did my part. So, <laughs> But it's interesting because ever since that moment that I submitted my paper and I, I had this Catholic reverend grade it, every time I would see him in the hallways on campus, after that moment, he would always be like, 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so I'm hoping we planted a seed there, even just to one soul, you know. But yeah, that was the second pillar of truth, like the, the true day of worship being Sabbath, because I really thought it was Sunday up until that point. And then the third one was just the beauty of prophecies and how the Bible actually interprets itself. You do not need a third person who could be biased or subjective to um, teach you the Bible. If you study it diligently with God's help, you'll see that the Bible can unlock itself, that for instance, the books of Daniel and Revelation go really hand in hand, you know, uh, when it comes to prophecy. Or you'll start to realize that a woman, the term woman in the, in the Bible could be both literal or symbolical for a church, right? Christ will return for his bride. So churches can also represent, um, be represented by the term women. So, um, yeah, I was just mesmerized. And then, of course, having um, Daniel interpret the dream of the king, you know, with the, with the I don't know how much you, you guys know about prophecy, but um, how, you know, he had this this figure and then different parts of, um, you know, gold, brass, copper, until the clay of feet, um, and how that was all symbolical or representative of different stages in human history. So for me, I was just mind blown when I, when I learned about that. And that pretty much was what I needed um, moving forward to know that this is a true church of the Lord. And um, yeah, from that moment onwards, I shifted my diet at 16 to a plant-based diet. And uh, I decided to go to church on Sabbath, Saturdays instead of Sunday. And um, yeah, I tried to practice that until it was time for my next chapter, which was college. So you are young in the faith. Your eyes were open. You found these amazing truths found in Scripture yeah. that really compelled you to believe in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And you were baptized at what age? Okay, so good question. Um, I, I basically went to college next, right? And college for me was in the United States. So... Immediately, I looked for a Seventh-day Adventist church here. I actually took up nursing in New York. Anyone from New York here? Oh, yeah. Welcome. That's actually where we're going next, um, after Chicago. Um, so, yeah, uh, I studied nursing in New York, and um, I found a Seventh-day Adventist church um, in Manhattan. So it's on, on the west, in the West Village. And, um, yeah, I basically continued keeping my Sabbath, continued my diet, and then from that Bible study, almost 10 years passed. And in 2008, I was finally, um, you know, approached by the pastor at that church. He told me, listen, Sandra, you're so active at church, you're leading the prayer groups in the afternoons, you know, the prayer meetings. Um, you would be a perfect candidate for baptism. But then I told him, I don't know, Pastor. I feel like I need to be perfect before I get baptized. There's so much I need to work on, you know. Um, I, I, I just didn't have a clear understanding of the concept of baptism, I guess. And, and so he told me, Sandra, he clarified this for me. Um, you know, to get baptized doesn't mean you have to be perfect because every day is, you know, always a journey with the Lord. But essentially what baptism implies is that you want to declare to heaven and to the earth what you believe in and what you stand for. In other words, it's like going official with my relationship with Jesus, right? And I finally understood this concept, and uh, yeah, it made sense to me. So I said, let me pray about it. And then I talked to my mom, because remember my mom and I, we started that Bible study together, and we also started keeping the Sabbath and shifting our diet and whatnot. So after all these years, I told her, Mom, I think it's time for me to get baptized. And you know what my mom said? She was like, what? I also want to get baptized. Let's do it together. And then I was like, oh, yeah, sure, that's great news. But make sure you're doing it for the right reasons, not just because I'm getting baptized. You know, you, you, know, you want to pray about it too. And she did, and she was still convinced. So she said, we're going to get baptized together. That was in 2008. And her only request was, since I'm the mom, I'm going to get immersed in the water first, okay? <laughs> so... So, so like, you know, respect for the elderly and like, okay, yes, no problem. So that happened in New York in 2008. The same year, I also graduated from nursing. And it was a big year for me. Um, yeah, brother, uh, it was a big year for me. Uh, 2008. 
Okay, so you, you were baptized into the faith, and you've learned that it's not the end-all, be-all. It's your official Facebook status, I'm in a relationship. <laughs> yes, I'm in exactly. the relationship with Jesus Christ. But things, but opportunities came knocking at your door. Now, you came here. You actually were in the presence of a celebrity. I don't know if you know that. In the Philippines. So tell me, what, what was the opportunity that came knocking at your door in the Philippines that allowed you to gain no, uh, popularity? You ask really good questions. It like matches <laughs> my journey. No. Well, basically after college, right, since I graduated, the next question was, what's next, right? High school done, college done. And so I was an international student in New York, and I obviously missed my family. So I decided to... to visit them in the Philippines, and pretty much from the moment I landed, I was approached by so many scouts. They were like, oh, she's back, because they remembered me from modeling, right, at the age of 16. Um, so I kind of had a following there for my, for my modeling career. But it wasn't until, like, after college, at the age of about 25, that they were like, man, you should join Miss Philippines. You're ready. You've got to hide the look, the education now. So you'd represent us really well. So there I was, approached with all these opportunities to join, and I kind of liked the idea. Um, I also justified with myself, maybe, maybe this is what God wants, because there's so many approaching me to do this. Um, and so I prayed. I was like, Lord, maybe I should join this pageant. Maybe if I win, I can bring more souls to you with the influence that I'm going to gain, you know? I just kind of wanted him to agree with me also. So I had this conversation, and, and I, I liked the idea, you know, because I was also still young. You know, coming from an environment like New York, where everyone's so ambitious and hardworking, that, that vibe was still kind of in me, you know? I, I didn't want to, like, stop now. How can I make an impact in this world? How can I, you know, leave, leave footsteps behind? Or Yeah, I, just, I was just young and hungry still to succeed. So... Um, that um, continued in my prayers and conversations with God. And so I, I decided to join. And guess what? I won. So I even more believed then that it was God's will because I won the crown. And I was like, wow, amazing. So that opened a lot of opportunities for me. So the crown that you got was not Miss Philippines. What, what was it? I, I joined the local pageant first. Okay. So it was actually Miss Earth, the pageant regarding... Um, environmental advocacies that I've joined in. So I joined, it's called Miss Philippines Earth um, in the Philippines, like the local one. But then when you win in the local pageant, you represent your country in Miss Earth, right? And so that's what happened. I, I won Miss Philippines Earth, which opened a lot of doors in the Philippines and also gave me the opportunity to represent the Philippines in Miss Earth International. And that's what I did next. And in Miss Earth... I won another crown, which is um, Miss Earth Air. It's like first runner-up because they have four crowns, Miss Earth, Miss Earth Air, Miss Earth Water, and Miss Earth Fire, the elemental um, court, they call it. So that opened opportunities for me at the international level. So not long after, I was pretty much on all these magazine covers. I was um, doing hosting gigs left and right. I was doing fashion shows, and I was um, making contacts and building connections with really influential people. It's nice to share this with the visuals. Maybe if you have time this afternoon, I'll, I'll share more at Glen Ellen Church. But um, yeah, it's, it's really intense, like how I suddenly was brought into this whole nother world, you know, after being a student and getting baptized and just experiencing fame overnight, pretty much. So um, yeah, I got so, so... Um, I always say sucked into the world again. Um, and there was this time that I wanted to keep going. And then I said, what else can I do? You know, I'm doing everything already. And I decided to start a business with another beauty queen. And uh, we, we launched a swimwear line because we're from the Philippines. It's a tropical country. And uh, yeah, I was basically doing all these things. But it wasn't until I had to turn over my crown, right? that I, I realized like things were changing. And uh, I know God was very patient with me because I was already with him, right? And I was, um, yeah, just keeping my Sabbath and everything and, uh, you know, changing my lifestyle. 
Um, but something happened. Uh, there was this Sabbath, um, one Sabbath, and there was this opportunity that was presented to me to do a, a dance number on national TV on Sabbath morning. So again, I talked to God. I was like, Lord, this is a really good opportunity. It's easy money. They'll pay me cash after. It's it's on Sabbath morning. No one will know because everyone will be at church. And I can just take the cash and go to church after and pay more tithes and offerings. You know, I was like just justifying how I really want to do this. And um, well, by now you probably figured me out. Did I do it or not? <laughs> oh, wow. You guys have so much faith. Um, I did. <laughs> Sorry to disappoint you. I did do it. Um, and it's just so crazy because... I, it really took like 10 minutes to dance number. I got the cash. I went to church. I submitted my tithes and offerings. And um, I thought I could get away with it. But two weeks later, it backfired at me. You know, the truth, the truth will always surface, no matter how much you try to hide it, right? So what happened was I came across one of, one of the brothers at church, and he comes to me and he goes, Sister Sandra, is it true that you danced on national television on Sabbath morning? We always say in, in Philippines or in Tagalog, patay, you know? Um, so here comes me, all um, like kind of like Adam and Eve, very human, trying to point a finger at someone else. It was a serpent, it was Eve, you know? You never want to take the blame right away if we can. Um, and I was like, how do you know that I did that? Do you watch TV on Sabbath morning? <laughs> <laughs> so we both kind of laughed about it. Um, but of course, anything that goes on national TV or social media, you know, it's bound to, to, to surface. And so I, I believe that it was God's gentle way of kind of knocking on my heart and telling me, my dear daughter, there are six other days and many different ways to earn money. You know, you don't have to sacrifice that one day that I ask of you. Yeah. So we just to, okay. So let's take a step back. So we learned that you had you found truth in Scripture, and your eyes were in line, and you felt God's goodness. But then, not opportunities started knocking at your door. You won Miss Earth Air, and then you started getting more gigs and opportunities because you got a crown. Mm -hmm. And so now you're left with this realization, I, I'm getting all this fame, I'm getting all this popularity, I have this business venture that is, that is going well, but then came a, p opportun uh, a point in your life where now your faith and your opportunity intersected. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You found out that this opportunity was leading all eyes, not on God, but to yourself. And so you felt that guilt. And you started feeling that shame because people are looking at you like, Sandra, you were dancing on Sabbath. I don't know how he knew. I don't know if YouTube, I don't know if YouTube was popular or if things were recorded back then, but they found out. And, you know, like you said, you started blaming. Maybe well, you're not supposed to do that. And, you know, you started realizing, you know, I'm feeling a little guilty because I tried justifying my own actions. So I want to sit on that. How did you... How did you respond once you felt that guilt and shame from people pointing at you saying, hey, look, you, were, you, are, you follow the Sabbath, you keep the health laws, you learn about prophecies, you are baptized in this believer as Sunday Adventist church, but you're not acting like that. That's how they see it. How did you respond to that guilt and shame? Well, definitely it made me feel uneasy. And in retrospect, I'm just really thankful because these kinds of experiences and realizations kind of brought me back to God, slowly but surely. I want to just add to that story that aside from that Sabbath situation, it all kind of happened pretty much consequentially that I also had to turn over my crowns, right? First, the local one, which wasn't so hard because I still had the international one, but then eventually I also had to give that one up. And then my business went downhill with my fellow beauty queen. We had like a falling out. So as all these things were happening, I just felt less and less confident. And then also when you turn over a crown, a new woman is in, in, is in the spotlight, right? So she gets all the attention. She gets all the opportunities. And so 
For someone like me who has been extracting a lot of my confidence and a lot of my value from the gigs and opportunities I was getting and, and the fame and the fortune that I was earning, um, I just felt like my value decreased and so did my confidence and I eventually reached a low point, right? Now, that was a very crucial moment in time and I'm so thankful that things didn't go otherwise because technically, when I was at that low and I was close to depression, I could have easily resorted to, let's say, the wrong crowd from the world and talk this out to alcohol or maybe to drugs even, right? Just to deal with this low in my life. But God is so good and um, His Holy Spirit really knocked on my heart and reminded me to go back to Scripture. So I went back to the Bible. And um, I tried to seek comfort in his word. And of course, what better book to read than the Bible when you're looking for comfort? Amen? That book is full of promises, full of hope and encouragement that you just really cannot help but, you know, get back on track because of God's goodness in there. And so he showed me step by step with specific verses the answers and um, the comfort that I needed at that point in life. And it's beautiful because the Bible tells us that um, more than striving for things on the earth, we should set our affections on things above, you know. And what would it profit a man, or in my case a woman, if she gains the whole world but loses her own soul, according to Mark 8.36, I believe. So, and then he took it a bit further where he revealed to me that there is a crown of life, an incorruptible crown, an unperishable crown that awaits everyone, according to 2 Timothy 4, 8. Not just me, but all those that await Jesus' appearing, you know, and are faithful to, till the end. A crown that we don't have to pass on, you know, a crown of life that, that um, is eternal and heavenly. So it really hit me in the heart, um, Brother Rodney, because I was like, you know, I had this tangible earthly crown, but God tells me there's an even better crown than that, you know, and that is the heavenly crown. So from that moment on, you know, my, my interests shifted, you know, and I also found all that comfort and um, God in his word, he does not make me feel guilty and shameful. He really makes me feel special. Psalms um, reveals that we were each fearfully and wonderfully made. There's only one Rodney. There's only one Sandra. There's only one of you, each one of you. And um, God really put a lot of thought into each one of us, gave us each specific talents, specific type of um, beauty, look, etc. cetera. Um, and everyone has a very specific purpose. So with that realization, I felt way more special than like, you know, and lastingly special than what, you know, I felt when I was just a beauty queen for a year. And of course, the ultimate reminder for me at that point became really Jesus' sacrifice on the cross because he, he already proved that he gave up his life for me and for you. Like, what more can I do but really um, thank him and give my life for him somehow? So remember that promise that I made to him that if I win a crown, I'm going to try to bring more people to him? So that at that point, I, I, you know, reconnected with God and I told him, Lord, I want to fulfill that promise to you right now with your help. If you can work with me and use me, whatever influence I still have after turning over the earthly crown, let's work together. I want to share your goodness with people. And God really gave me the opportunity. He gave me um, spaces and places to share my testimony. First in the Philippines, but then he, he's so good because he knows I love to travel. And then eventually internationally, like we'd be going to places like Papua New Guinea, to um, uh, the Emirates, like Dubai, then to Italy, and then now the United States for the third time. You know, and everything, everything that I previously experienced during my earthly journey to the crown, um, he kind of paralleled that by also giving me a chance to be on magazine covers, a chance to, you know, speak to different audiences, a chance to launch um, another fashion brand, but this time advocating for modest clothing, and also meeting a lot of prominent people 
but people who love and serve God. So there's strong parallelism. It's really nice when you see it visually, but I'm trying my best to describe it to you, how God works in really great ways. So I thought my will and my ways were awesome, and, and it was a great, you know, plan for me, but God had a way better plan. That's why what you read in Isaiah about his ways being higher than ours is so true, and I really for, experienced it firsthand. So thank you so much for sharing and being vulnerable with, you know, how you felt in that moment. It was, it could be so easy to pivot into in a, a way to self-medicate that how the world medicates and how they've tried to find value and how they try to figure out how to deal with this guilt and shame that as everyone in this world, it real, helps us realize that we are all sinners. We're all broken. And so I love your testimony that in that moment of feeling guilt and shame, you did not sit on that and hide and cower and like Adam and Eve did. But instead... You resorted to go to Christ. And I want to share with, um, as we start to wrap up, um, some verses that share, tell us exactly what we need to hear. Ephesians 4, verse 2, verse 4 and 5. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Lamentations 3, verse 22 and 23, the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. If only if we come to the realization, and this is the reason why we always fail, because we're not realizing that what we read in Scripture is truly real and effective for us today, that we are loved by a great Father. We are loved by one who does not make us feel guilt or shame, but continues to shower his goodness and love and mercy to us. That God is offering something better, not just a crown that will fade away. As you mentioned, after that year, on comes another model who, who, who is able to promote the next the next year, who has the next fame, the next opportunity, and it's temporary. But with God, he gives us something so much better that's everlasting. So I want to give, give a hand to God for your, your testimony and sharing and being willing to allow yourself to open up. Yeah. And I just wanted to add to what you just uh, mentioned, which is so beautiful, that, you know, guilt and shame is always a choice. I mean, of course, we want to do our best in this life, right? But there will come moments where we might fall short or we might, you know, make a mistake or something might happen and we truly regret it. But I, I always try to emphasize that, you know, we, we have an option. God is there and he doesn't want us to go anywhere else but to him. And he's ready to mercifully forgive us, especially if we're willing to repent and improve. So just... Go to God and know that you have a choice and you know that you don't have to rest in this guilt and this shame and this fear and all of that. But, you know, you can trust in his promises. You can trust in his word. And he's really, really going to work ways and wonders and miracles in your life if you allow him to. So choose, choose God always. And yeah, like, I know there's so much more we could discuss, but due to time, time frame right now, um, I just want to make sure that you always stay encouraged, no matter how hard life may be or how much war and, and turbulence goes around in the news today. We have this hope and we have this comfort because we have a God that has provided that for us, and he will never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you. So Pastor Nestor is going to come up, and we're going to learn more about what it means that through God, he offers us something better. Thank you.